The Maybury Investments Limited Virtual Investor Forum has been the standard for investor education in Jamaica for decades, where top financial minds provide comprehensive insight into the market and ideal investment strategies and opportunities for our clients. Celebrating 37 years of excellence in investment banking. The Mayberry Virtual Investor Forum. Investing in Jamaica. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I'm your host, Dan Theok, Senior Vice, Senior Vice President of Investment Banking here at Mayberry Investments Limited. And today we'll be doing a review of the results for Mayberry Jamaica Equities Limited for their year ended 2023. On the panel today, we're going to have Christopher Berry, the Executive Chairman, along with the Investment Manager Representative Gary Parrott. Thank you, Gary, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Welcome. If you're a fan of the content, then don't forget to subscribe. Also, hit the bell to stay up to date with the channel. We upload content like this every week. And I remind you that we'll be having our Q&A segment at the end of the program, so please stick around until then or send in your questions. If you want to embark on your very first investment journey, take that first step with Mayberry. Follow us on social media to learn more about how you can get started today. Okay, as promised, I'd like to start with a presentation review uh, that I'm going to conduct on Mayberry Jamaican Equities. I want to remind you again that Mayberry Investments, while being the largest shareholder in MJE, I operate as an independent analyst. So we're going to start with the Mayberry um, perspective on the performance, and then um, I'll have some questions and answers. We'll have some direct questions for Christopher Berry, and then we'll also get some comments from uh, Gary Parrott. Okay, so first slide shows you the key results. And uh, I want to note that 2023 in general is a very challenging year for the market. The main market index was down by approximately 18%. The financial uh, index was down by 17%. And the junior market was down by 3.5%. And this is against the backdrop of high inflation generally and high interest rates during the year 2023. I also want to remind you that MGE is an investment company that seeks to achieve long-term capital appreciation by investing in high-quality publicly listed entities. So all of the assets or investments in the MGE portfolio are publicly listed companies, um, hand-chosen by uh, Mr. Barry and his team, and they're building this portfolio for long-term value creation. And what do I mean by long-term value creation? Let me just give an example. MJE had its IPO debut back in July 2018 when 10% of the shares were listed and MIL, after the transaction, then owned 75% of the company. After listing, they had $110 million in assets. Uh, today, we're going to see those asset values have increased to $158 million. So while total assets are down by 2% year over year, in the last five years since listing, total assets would be up by 60%, 68%, which is a CAGR of 10%, a combined annual growth rate of 10% per annum in US dollar terms. So from my point of view as an analyst, that's uh, pretty good results. In the last year, shareholders' equity is also down by 14% or about $16 million as a result of the overall loss in trading and value in the last year. Um, the net book value is also down 14%. Uh, the closing share price is down 24% to $9.95 as at December 31st, 2023. All of the results we're talking about are to that period. And they had total comprehensive loss for the year of $18 million. Looking at that in the next slide, you can sort of see details of that compre comprehensive loss of $18.3 million. It included net operating loss of $14.5 million, $1.4 million in operating expenses, a, and then a net loss after taxation of $16 million. There are some OCI adjustments of $2.4 million, and that resulted in the total comprehensive loss of $18.3 million for 2023. So again, overall, stock market was down. 
Most of the investments are marked to market, and in that process of marking those investments to market, they incurred an overall $16 million loss for the year, as compared to the $36 million gain that they experienced in the previous year. But again, on a five-year chart, uh, overall asset values are up $60 million. So from year to year, you're going to have great years, good years, and then sometimes you'll have a few um, down periods. And notably in the last five years, I think MJ has experienced two or three years which were down, uh, two pri prior because of COVID and now one because of high interest rate regime and the stock market generally being slow. So my expectations as an analyst, interest rates are going to start to trend back down in the next three to six months. Inflation will eventually come under control and you're going to see uh, market prices jumping. Um, we know that PEs are inversely related to interest rates. That's to say the value of stocks in general um, are inversely related to interest rates. So in high interest rate regimes, you tend to see market values coming down. And in low interest rate regimes, you tend to see those values jumping up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go throughout the program. Next slide shows you top five additions um, Sorry, total assets. Okay, yeah, total assets. Yes, I've spoken to this um, again year over year, down by 1.6 percent from 161 million to 159 million. We see total liabilities increasing by 16 million or 50 percent. Uh, shareholders' equity, as we explained, down by 18 million dollars or 14.4 percent, and the net book value per share down 14.4 percent. Next slide shows sort of major changes in stock positions. Yeah. By popular request, we like to show top five additions, top five disposals. Nothing major here. Largest disposal I can see is Carib Cement, approximately $596,000. Um, and in the last quarter, the largest uh, two additions were JBG and JMMB, $1.75 and $1.2 million, US dollars respectively. In terms of the composition of the top 10 um, holdings on the next slide. It gives you a feel for what the top 10 positions are this year compared to last year. Uh, again, no significant changes there. Uh, when I take a look, I only see one new kid on the block, so to speak, and that would be Dollar Financials Services. We see that one coming into the top 10 for the first time, now representing 2.2% of the portfolio. So I'll definitely have a question for Chairman Barry about that. And then you see um, the position in Carib Cement being reduced such that Carib Cement is no longer in the top 10. Uh, Carib Cement previously representing about 1.3% of the portfolio. Um, the changes in values here, for instance, SVL uh, going from 61% of the portfolio to 55% of the portfolio is probably primarily related to the 10% fall in the value of the SVL stock. Similarly, we see CPJ falling from 11% to 8%. And again, that's probably associated with a 20% fall in CPJ stock. Uh, and we'll be talking about those uh, two entities, two two large holdings of MGE. Notably, NCB is relatively flat, and you can see NCB makes up about 3% of the portfolio. Quickton's, you know, uh, reasonably flat, makes up about 3.7% of the portfolio. Um, that stock post year end, we've seen that stock price uh, running away. So it closed year end at 79 cents. When I last checked, Wigton was at $1.10, has traded as high as $1.20. Again, I presume there's some noise going on there pertaining to the fact that come May, the 10% uh, shareholder restriction, largest shareholder can only own 10% of Wigton shares. And that was a constraint when it was first listed five years ago, May 20. 19, that constraint goes away in May 2024, and we can only imagine that there's going to be a run on Wigton as somebody tries to gain uh, control of that business. That could be one of the reasons why we see the stock price running in recent times. So other than that, no other notable uh, large differences in the 10 top, top 10 shareholders. They obviously like SVL and CPJ, and we'll be talking about that. Similarly, JBG, etc., um, good to know. Next slide shows in a graphical format, we've talked about it, what's happened with the um, net book value per share. And we like to show how that um, stock price is trading relative to the NAV. So the, the NAV or the total assets minus um, liabilities, or shareholders equity, uh, it gives you a sense as to what's the total capacity of the business. And we like to show that in the form of a NAV. 
Um, and then we like to compare that to the stock price. And so whenever you, when you consider that this is a sort of an ETF or a fund, the you would think that the sum of the the sum of the parts is the whole, right? So it's it's not logical that when you add up the valuation of all of the stocks and you divide it by the total number of shares, that's your NAV, that you would see that the portfolio's value is 144 that's kind of like the breakup value of the business, so to speak. And yet the share price is tra trading at nine ninety five, And so it's very interesting. Similarly, last year when the NAV was at sixteen forty six, when it closed at sixteen forty six in December 2022, the share price was thirteen sixteen. So it's interesting over the last three, four years. And I, th I think it has something to do with the maturity of the market. It'll be a question we'll discuss again that we see the share price trading at a discount to the NAV. Now, this is not a business that you're going to value based on EPS, but rather on the NAV because it's, again, we talked about what the purpose of the company was. It was to hold assets for long-term growth and capital appreciation. So it's not logical to us to see the stock price trading at a 30% discount to the NAV, and that's what's happening um, at, at, at the end of December. So the 995 relative to 1440 is a 30% discount to the NAV compared to in the prior year end, December 2022, when it was trading at a 20% discount to the NAV. So not logical, folks. When you see the stock price substantially below the NAV, even 10%, it's a great buying opportunity. Uh, and in this case, the, even the NAV itself is suppressed, right? Because we're saying because of the high interest rate regime, the fall off from 1646 to 1440 is mainly because of the high interest rate regime. When you look at the quality of assets that uh, Mayberry is holding, the SVLs and the CPJs, uh, even NCBs, you know, these are strong companies who we think will continue to deliver great shareholder value. So it's just a matter of time before the share prices come back. So again, these two graphs tell me that there's a great buying opportunity to get you guys some MJE. When it's trading at a 30% discount, something's definitely wrong. It's super cheap. Next slide shows the graphically how the relationship to the NAV and the stock price um, have uh, moved over the last um, two plus years with the um, orange line being the stock price and the blue line being the NAV. And you can see for a very short period between March and September of 2022, the um, book value is higher than the NAV. And you would expect that in a market that's bullish, where people have beliefs belief in the company and its growth potential. So you could see temporarily where people would pay a premium to get in. And, and that's what I would expect to see when the market's bullish and confidence is strong. And when the market's bearish, I'm not saying I don't expect to see some small discount, but it's it's a 20 or 30 percent discount just doesn't make sense. And you can see the gap widening um, in recent times. Um, again, I think if you look at that today, stock price is probably up to 1050. So the gap's closed a little bit, but there's still a great opportunity to get yourselves some MJE. So that's my perspective as the analyst. I like the stock. I like the company. I like the potential. I think it's a great buying opportunity. And uh, with that, I'm going to get into my questions. And I, I really want to start firstly with Mr. Barry. It's great to have him here in studios. And so my first question to you, Mr. Barry, is going to be on CPJ, because my second question will be to Mr. Parrott on SVL, and I'll allow him to declare all of the conflicts that he needs to declare at that point in time. CPJ, second largest holding in MJE. Mr. Barry, we've seen that stock price as high as $20. We saw it come back down to 12. Now it's around about $10. We've seen the company grow uh, and do reasonably well. Tell us why you like CPJ so much and why it's why it's in your portfolio. So um, many years ago, we got a research department to analyze all the different industries in Jamaica. And uh, the industry that consistently grew through good times and bad was hospitality and restaurants. And uh, CPJ is the top purveyor to the hotels mm -hmm. in Jamaica. So we figured it would be good to hitch a ride on that industry. And uh, CPJ was the best place, the best stock on the market that 
represented that industry. So that's why we bought CPJ. And how do you feel about it um, for the medium to long term? We consider that stock um, is highly dependent on tourism. We think tourism is going to do exceptionally well in Jamaica. I mean, how do you feel about CPJ today um, and, and your, your prospects of growth for that business? So uh, CPJ has been having excellent numbers over the last couple of years. And... Um, those numbers have been bolstered by, you know, the expansion in the hotel industry, which is very strong. You just have to drive on the North Coast and you see all the new properties going up or try to book a room in a hotel. The prices we're paying today is not what we used to pay five years ago. The prices are up, the number of rooms are up, and the number of visitors are, are strong. So it's a very strong industry. And um, I think the growth prospects are great. So the other thing people need to understand about CPJ is um, CPJ is in about three different businesses. Um, we have a commodity business, um, which are the meats and, you know, the, the, the general foods that are imported into the island for the hotels. And this is pretty much a commodity business. Um, the chefs, they require certain minimum standards. But basically, mm -hmm. they're looking at price. So that that market is always volatile, and it can affect the results. Then we have our alcohol business. We're probably the largest importer of spirits into the country. And um, that business is very strong, has strong margins, and uh, it just keeps growing, and we keep getting better and better brands. And then the third line of business at CPJ is, is the whole manufactured business. So we make bacon, mm -hmm. uh, we process beef, fish, uh, uh, you know, those kind of things. There are commodities too, but there's some transformation there, some value added, which affects the price and, and, and improves the margins, making it a little better than the commodities. So those are the basic three businesses that we're in. And um, all of them are very strong right now. And in that space, CPJ is very strong in terms of uh, supplying the, the tourism sector. I mean, they're, they're like the, one of the largest purveyors. Not one of the largest. We are the largest purveyor to the hotel industry in Jamaica. Excellent. Good to hear that. Okay, speaking of the biggest and baddest, Mr. Peart, we Supreme Ventures, it makes up 50% of the MJ portfolio. I presume that may have something to do with why you are the executive CEO there. Uh, we've seen that stock as high as $35.00. Uh, settled at thirty dollars last year, now down to twenty seven dollars. You know, tell us about SVL, why it's in the MGE portfolio and what the growth prospects of MG of SVL are. Yeah, um my comments will be limited, um, because the the audited financials should have been out on the twenty ninth. Um but based on IFRS and auditors' requests, it's delayed. So I can't speak too much <clears throat> on what's happening in recent time. But, you know, like as Chris indicated, we can speak to the origin. And it was pretty simple. Um, one, they were first in that, in, that, in that category. Two, it's a very high dividend yielding stock. They pay 90% of profits um, in dividends. And also, we saw that Supreme had still had a capacity for material growth and capital appreciation. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that. Um, the, the team that we put together, um, you know, we, we, they went into Supreme in and around October 2017. The company was doing about a billion dollars then. Um, per annum. Per annum. Mm -hmm. And as you know, last year, you know, the company recorded $3 billion in, in, in profit. So, you know, from 2017, we'll call it 2018, um, till now, that's six, five years, uh, we've been able to, what's that, grow the profits by over 200%. Yep. Um, so that demonstrated that, you know, there is indeed uh, material profit growth um, in the company. People saw it as a mature company. We haven't. Um, you know, as you know, it has recently expanded into Ghana. Um, that's that's something that's a, a work in progress. As I pointed out, Jamaica has 3 million, a population of 3 million. Ghana has 34 million. Um, so the point at which we can establish that business there, the potential for further growth and material upside is, 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 is significant. 
Um, we're currently in Guyana. It's a much smaller uh, population footprint. But what Guyana did, Guyana allowed us to roll out what we think is the most important asset right now in the company, which is our proprietary um, lottery software. And we think we can monetize that, you know, over time. And that is where significant growth will continue will continue to come from. You know, the the key area of Supreme that, you know, attracted, you know, certainly the neighbor investors. In every business, you record an accounting profit. And then depending on your receivables, you actually monetize or crystallize a profit in cash, sometimes as long as six months after. At Supreme, you monetize that that profit up on average seven days later, you know, which is why you can pay that level of aggressive um, dividends, which is good. So as you grow the profits, your dividends are going to grow with it. Um, you know, so again, from memory, when we when we invested, I believe the stock price was between eight or nine dollars. Then, as you have indicated, it went as high as thirty five. At a high point, it like it also has increased over two hundred percent. I think it's trade somewhere around twenty six, twenty seven dollars now. Um, but you know, the, the future that we see for the company, we think the upside is 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 materially greater, which is why we hold the, we continue to hold the position uh, that we hold in. The final point I'll make to you is. You know, the metrics that we use on the JSC to value companies are very different in international markets, especially for niche businesses like gaming. And if you look on the multiples that's used to to value gaming companies internationally, you will see that SVL is trading uh, below that. So again, you know, certainly at MJE, um, we think Supreme has a very bright future. And, you know, as that starts to make itself known to people, um, you will see the price do what we expect it to do. Excellent. So t t two points I want to make, folks, for you guys to appreciate. So in the case of CPJ, I think we own approximately 20%. And in the case of SFL, I want to say approximately 18%. They're about 18-19. 18-19%. So, so, so MJ has taken uh, fairly substantial equity positions in these entities and then gotten involved in helping the businesses in any, in, any, in any way can Correct. to help create value. In the, cre in the case of Sville, where you came in at under $10, stock price is now at $27. So stock price has grown by over 200% and the profitability of the business has grown by over 200%. Yes. It's a market leader and it throws off crazy cash and dividends. So yes. that's the Sville play, you know, Claire's day to me and the CPJ play leader into tourism space. Um, and that business also, I remember that stock price being $4 um, thereabouts five years ago. And now that stock price is at nine ten dollars um, I think the business is um, tremendously undervalued because of the potential for growth that it has. They did seven eight million dollars seven million dollars profit last year. This year they're probably going to do a little bit better. But more importantly, with over five thousand hotel rooms under construction, I think the potential to grow their top line revenues by twenty twenty five percent is substantial. Mm -hmm. And with their net profit margin, I think the ability to double their profit could be over the next three to four years. So that's how I see the play in CPJ and in um, Sville. But when you guys first made the investment, Mr. Barry, um, you know, you weren't involved in running those businesses. Uh, when you're making these investments, um, two part question, in your, in your mantra, you say you look for high quality assets. Uh, and I would like to think management is a, you know, keen part of that. So two part question, when you're making these decisions, how mm. important is the management of the business? And then how important is it for you to necessarily get involved? So those are my two questions for you uh, when you're investing and making large investments. So the ideal situation would be for us not to be involved at all. Uh, but sometimes, you know, the companies ask us to take a bigger role and if we can help, we try and help. Um, after all, we have money on the line too. Um, but ideally, we prefer not to be involved um, because we our main job is to seek new good quality investments. Mm -hmm. And so the more time we spend in these companies that we have significant interests are the less time we have to look for new investments. Got it. Okay, so we understand SVL, we understand... CPG very well. Uh, 
One of you tell me about Dollar. Now, I know you guys have invested in the space before. You once had a large position in Access Financials. And now, all of a sudden, last year, we see Dollar popping up to the radar. Can somebody tell me about the Dollar play? You know, what's happening there and what's the thought process? Either of the two of you. True. Uh, Gary, you go first. Yeah. So, as you're aware... Um, we're probably the first company to have really monetized and scaled a microfinance business. And we did that with Access Financial. I think when we invested in Access, they were making about $7 million per annum. Um, Jamaican. Jamaican dollars. <laughs> uh, when we exited, um, we had grown that business to about $300 million. Um, I think we exited at a good time because I think since then, we exited somewhere around 2013, 2014. And now about 10 years later, they're still making on or about the same money. Um, so since then, I mean, we have looked on different investments. Uh, the business has grown. And we had the opportunity to invest in dollar um, because we saw some of the metrics um, that made sense. You know, the management team, um, you know, their credit model based on how they went about doing their business. Um, that, that, that attracted us um, to the investment. Um, we made the investment, and since we have made the investment, you know, the company continues to hit their targets. Um, you know, you had an initial hiccup, but, you know, we're able to get over that, as we do with most of our businesses. Um, the, C, the current CEO is doing a phenomenal job, um, Ken Roy, along with Trevine. And, you know, they're young, they're aggressive, they understand their parameters, and they're executing um, accordingly. You know, so, and we've seen that um, show in the stock price to date. You know, I think we invested, since we have made the investment, I think the stock price has been up about 30 or 40 percent. Um, we expect that to continue, certainly for um, 20, 2024. And again, some of those metrics we like. So what are the things some people miss in the, in the microfinance? Right now, dollar is in its growth stage. So it's going to suck a lot of capital. Uh, but Mayberry has the ability to raise capital. And we have been doing so. We have, we have, we have pumped over a billion dollars um, into, into dollars since we have gotten involved. Um, but one of the things people might not appreciate about a microfinance company is that in that growth stage, you know, whilst you're pumping in capital, you will get to a point, just like any other business, um, where it matures a bit and it will slow down. And what we love about the microfinance model is that when you get to that stage, you see the reverse of what you had in the growth phase where you have to be pumping in a lot of capital. It will start to throw off a ridiculous amount of cash, um, you know, which we saw in the initial investment that we had done. And when you get to that stage, you know how you can have the reverse whereby you can front load dividend payments because the rate at which the company throws off cash. And so it's a sector that has always attracted us. And once you have the right players, the right management, and the right core principles in place, it's a sector that we will spend a lot of time in. And we expect big things from dollar. I mean, I could have a business. I mean, the future is there. You will have some ups and downs. But I think with a team in place, uh, we'll see more ups than downs. Okay, good deal. Uh, Chairman, follow up on that microfinance space. You, you seem to like the space. Oh, we, we love the space. So what we love about the space is um, is that, uh, you know, cr credit is not something that's very accessible to most Jamaicans. And um, if you've ever dealt with a bank, you know that banks don't really have the capacity to deal with the ordinary Jamaican. So um, you have companies like Courts, um, that looks mm -hmm. actually look like an appliance trade, appliance sales company was actually um, a credit company. Microfinance business. And, um, you know, we, we feel the, 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 sk the scope for this business in Jamaica is really just beginning. And um, down the road, you're going to see some of these types of companies. They're going to grow as large as some of the banks that you see in Jamaica now. So I think if you bring the right the right uh, grouping of things together, the right technology, the right management team, 
the right uh, financial group that can raise the capital, structure the deck correctly, you know, the right incentives for the management. Um, you're, you're in a high growth business for the next 20 years. So I, I think it's really a fantastic opportunity. You know, the devil is in the details and the execution is always a big point, the big um, stumbling block and um, keeping everybody on the same page over a period of time. You know, when these companies start to make money, you know, when they're not making money, it's, it's easy to partner. But when the money starts rolling in, you know, that's where the trouble begins. So, you know, it, it hopefully, um, you know, we, we, we've done this rodeo a couple of times and um, maybe we can take this one to the, we only got to 300 million a year the last time. And uh, when we were exiting, we were hoping to hit a billion within two years. We're all set up to do it. Um, we couldn't agree. So we had to separate. Um, but this time we're looking for something much bigger. We're looking for billions. We, we, we love the opportunity. Okay. I hear you loud and clear. Okay, folks. Remember, we'll be taking your questions uh, coming in. And I see quite a few coming in. And so I want to... Uh, throw the first one over to uh, Mr. Berry. It's coming from Tryon Browning. And he's saying, Mr. Berry, what did you mean when you tweeted, the money is banking up, good cheap stocks are scarce, uh, get the good ones before the spending starts? Was this a reference to ECL's expansion or anything like that? What, what did you mean by this? Good stocks are cheap, get them before they're scarce and people start spending. What did you mean, sir? You're talking to me, Dan? Yes, sir. Yeah. That, that question was for you. The money is backing up. Good stocks are scarce. Get the good ones before the so, spending so starts. So in, in, in Jamaica, um, Jamaican financial sector is very much like a herd. Herdish. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody tends to move in the same direction at the same time. So, you know, about three years ago, the BOJ started jacking up rates uh, interest rates, uh, the brakes went on an investing. Um, uh, you saw a slowdown in construction, I think, uh, last year for the first time in a long time. The numbers were actually flat, where it was growing before. You know, it was one of the strongest sectors, actually. I remember one year, I think it grew almost 9% yeah, or something absolutely. like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so when the interest rates go up, the brakes go on. And um, if you think about the pension funds, right, most of the pension money in Jamaica is, is in like three small or three large pools. You know, it's not managed by a lot of people. And whether it's the national, the NIF money, or the money on Sajikor, Guardian, NCB, these guys pull back when they see the interest rates going up. They switch to investing in fixed income. They stop investing in equities. And the money just piles up. And, um, you know, I heard comments come uh, in January. They have the annual stock exchange conference. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of people saying, hey, you know, the market's not going to turn until the interest rates start coming down. And that's not going to happen until the third, fourth quarter and all of this stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know. If you're a student of the markets and you you read people like Warren Buffett and, and Peter Lynch and these guys, they will always tell you, hey, the, um, managing stocks, buying stocks, investing in stocks is not, you know, don't try to be an economist. That's a different game, right? You, you see a good stock at a good price. Um, and especially if the price is lower than it typically is. Uh, un unless you know that there's going to be some catastrophe coming around the corner, then you should buy. And so you have a lot of pent-up money on the sidelines. And you, you, you look at some of the numbers that have been coming out, they've been good. And um, MJE is already up almost 10% this year already, and we're, not in, we're just in the beginning of March. Um, you know, Scotia is up big. There's a lot of stocks that are up big. Um, so those who are going to wait around until they recognize what's going on 
they're, they're going to miss a big upside in the market. Oh, thanks for that clarification. Oh, one more oh, thing done. Um, the next thing is that, hey, you know, I, I think the inflation cycle in the world, you know, there there's always different factors that's affecting it. And it may have fundamentally changed. So everybody thinks inflation is coming down, um, but there's different things happening now that could actually make inflation stay high for longer than normal. You know, you have a lot of wars going on and you have a lot of central banks that are de-dollarizing right now. And this is going to have an impact on global interest rates. And um, the world's not going to stop turning because interest rates are marginally higher than they were in the last 20 years. You know, people still going to be investing and expanding. So um, don't don't just try to be an economist. <laughs> you know, it's not the same game. You know, you see something cheap, especially companies that are growing and show that they can grow consistently over time and they're trading below where they normally trade. Uh, now is the time. Get them. Agreed. And two points to support what you said. So one, you know, this thing about trying to time the market, it's not a it's not a good good idea. You want to have time in the market. You you want to invest and invest for the medium to long term. That's what's going to pay the best rewards. And then when we talk about um, high interest rates and how that could impact the market, Troyan, just imagine if, if you guys can get access to the, the BOJ results of the auctions, it's a great way to see what's happening. Over a hundred billion dollars of money gone after 30 day government paper and earning 10% per annum. So imagine you could invest for 30 days and earn 10%. There's $100 billion worth of people doing that. Um, for uh, 180, 90 days, 275, whatever, it's the same thing. Over $200 billion of money today is tied up in um, fixed income, short-term, relatively short-term investments because these big folks that Chris just mentioned are parking their money, pausing. And what's going to happen is when the market starts to move, when interest rates start to come down, all of a sudden they're going to be like, oh, I can't make 10% doing nothing anymore. You know, that rate's coming from half percent per annum, by the way. I'm going to bet you in 12 months is going to be at, say, 6%. It's going to fall substantially. When they can't earn 10% doing nothing, they're going to go back to the stock market. So it's just a matter of time before the rates start to come down and they're going to be, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars trying to shift asset classes. They, they don't want to be in fixed income. That's not their long-term desire. They want to be in better quality um, asset classes like equities or real estate. Real estate's a little bit hot right now. Equities are on the low. Fixed income's kicking butt because the interest rates are high. So we're going to see huge shift in investment policies going back to equities when that market starts to move and when the interest rates come down. So that's how the relationships work, work, folks. And that's why we're saying now is the time to invest, get in while the stocks are relatively cheap. I believe that's the main point. Next question comes in from Philip Burgess. Philip's asking, um, several experts like Keith Duncan, et cetera, have expressed the opinion that BOJ rates won't fall until late in the year. Um, etc. Several companies, though, are expected to have stellar results this year, like NCB, Mayberry Group, SVL, CPJ, etc. At what point do you uh, esteem advisors say forget the interest rates and just focus on um, good companies to get in? So, Philip, yep, I didn't even know that was your question. I think we just answered. Now, 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 now is the time to invest because, as you said, uh, we're seeing companies showing stellar results. Now, by sector, financial sector, I think, again, as interest rates come down, you're going to see those companies do tremendously well. I mentioned it earlier in the program, the financial sector entities in general are down in terms of valuation by 17.7% last year. So they're hit hardest with high interest rates. And those are the companies which are going to bounce back strongest, in my view, when the interest rates come down. So if you see a good bank or financial sector company that you like, it's got a strong brand, uh, they've been around for 100 years, 50 years, whatever, great management. Over the next 12 months, those are the entities that are going to have the biggest bounce back or have the potential to have the biggest bounce back. And so that explains perhaps why Mr. Bray went and bought a lot of NCB um, last year, uh, because it's a great bet. 
Um, so that's our view. So Philip, we agree with you. Now is the time to invest. Don't try to time the market. Don't wait till you think the interest rates are coming down because there's over a hundred billion dollars of um, investments sitting in fixed income right now that their signal to move is going to be when they start to see the interest rates coming down. So you want to be ahead of those guys. That would be my opinion and my view. Um, other questions? Um, I've noticed the increased position in MEEG. What's the expectation around that investment given it forms such a small part of MGE's portfolio? So Gary, I'm going to kick that one over to you. Um, someone's saying we've noticed uh, increased position in uh, MEEG, and what's your expectation around that investment, uh, given it's such a small part of the um, MJ portfolio? But I'll add to that, it complements SVL to some extent. So, sir, could you please tell us a little bit about um, what you guys think are happening with main entertainment group, by the way, for MEEG? Right. So, um, main event, uh, for full disclosure, Supreme Ventures owns 10% of main event, and also uh, MJE owns 10% um, or more of main event. And so the reason behind that is very simple. Um, we believe um, that main event is the number one vehicle for entertainment events, setting up entertainment events, et cetera, um, in the country. Um, the, public and it's the only public vehicle um, that's available. So the work that Solomon Sharp and Richie Bear has been doing at main event has been amazing. Um, they control quite a bit of the market, um, not just because of their size, but because of their ability to execute and execute consistently well over time. Um, we believe they're still not even scratching the surface. There are a lot of different areas that they can expand into. Um, you know, one of the things about a growing economy is that it creates opportunities for a lot of businesses. The entertainment sector, I think, is a sector that is significantly misunderstood. Uh, it has the potential to become a very big part of the Jamaican economy. A lot of it is potentially underground. And I think the vehicle that cannot long, uh, that can unlock a lot of this value is main event. You know, um, if we think we have a lot of events now, you know, you know, based on what we've seen in the tourism space, um, it can increase by another factor of 10 to 100 times. You know, and I think if that happens or when that happens, main event is an entity that's going to take full advantage of that. So that has always been our long-term view, which is why first MJE and ultimately SVL, which while some people focus on it as a lottery company, it's, it's, it's also a gaming and entertainment um, business. And certainly through our investment in Supreme Ventures, Race and Entertainment, also known as Caymanas Park, um, 2024 is going to be the year where we ramp up our activities on the entertainment side. Um, we'll be making a, an announcement in the next couple of weeks to show us, to show that they're mo we're moving deeper into that space. Um, and I believe through Mayberry, um, there is an opportunity where we're going to democratize the entertainment business, meaning we're going to create a vehicle that will allow members of the public to participate in entertainment events. Um, so once we finalize that, um, you can stay tuned for that. And I think once we're able to do that, um, we'll, be, we'll be able to show people how much more um, that, that can be done. So you'll have consistent um, number of events, but more importantly, quality of events. All right, thanks for that. Chairman Barry? Yes. Uh, so the truth is, we didn't really increase our investments in uh, main event. We own 10% from long time, but sometimes when prices go crazy, we take profits. And um, last year, Gary looked at me and said, but Chris, we are down below 10%. We need to get back up to our 10%. So that's really all it was about. But, you know, Gary, he's never going to lose an opportunity to sell. <laughs> so he had to tell you, you know, the whole pitch behind the, the overall investment. So that we, we're not really increasing our position. We're just going up back to 10%, which is where we were long ago. Good deal. Thanks for that, Chairman Barry. And I, I, I appreciate the strategy and, and the entity, Gary, when we consider, again, the Jamaican economy um, is really poised to grow. 
And with that, people will have more disposable income. And with that, I expect the entertainment sector is just going to continue to grow. Uh, it also complements tourism and expansion we're seeing in tourism. And it's a sector that, you know, up to today, to date is really served mostly by the informal sector. So as Chairman Barry pointed out, it's one of the MEEG, that is main events, the only publicly listed entity that's really tapping into that space in an aggressive way. And so it makes good sense for us to want to jump into that. Okay, let me take one or two more questions before we uh, bring this to a close. Um, I see one coming in from Devon. I'm going to read it. Not too sure we can actually answer it, Devon, but I will read it. Out of respect, how will MGE, how does MGE plan to finance their expected increased position in Wigton? when the limitation expires. So I, I I didn't say we were going to be increasing our position in, in Wigton when the 10% um, threshold goes away, um, unless Chairman Barry has tweeted it and I'm not aware of it. We know the 10% no. cap goes away in May and uh, I'm gonna bet somebody's gonna, <laughs> somebody's gonna increase their position and try to take control of that lovely entity for which I'm a director, by the way, but I have no knowledge of any such thing. So. Um, I can declare the conflict since I have no knowledge, but it's, I, I think it's going to happen, Devin. So great insight there. And to, again, come May, the 10% constraint goes away. Today, uh, MJ is the largest shareholder owning 10%, um, followed closely by VM that owns roughly like 9.9%. .9%, and then the other notable top five shareholders would include like ATL Pension and NIF, National Insurance Fund. So it's got a great lineup of top five. Uh, but nobody was allowed to get beyond 10%, and we would certainly love to see um, see um, see that happening. So, Dan. Yes, sir. The answer to the question. Yes, sir. Mayberry has never had a problem financing investments. Mm -hmm. In Jamaica, we find that good investments are few, so financing them is always not difficult. And at Mayberry, you guys certainly know how to do that. I noted you closing the 12 million US dollar raise for Express Catering Limited on Friday. And we can't wait to see what else Mayberry has in the making. And, you know, for the records, Wigton, um, although a top 10 um, shareholding of MJE, Devon, only represents 3.7% of the total portfolio. So I don't think Mr. Barry is going to have any problem, even if he wanted to double or triple his position in Wigton. But good question, just to say. Well, I mean, if, if I can add, and it's, it's important to say this, um, you know, because a lot of people have different views about the removal of the cap. And so certainly from a Mayberry perspective, or all years of experience dealing with different companies, etc. Um, companies that do well are companies that have or that are focused, and their the control issue is not a problem. And I think what happens is that in removing the cap, it sets the stage for somebody or a group of bodies to try and take control of a company. And the argument and the belief is that in that environment, it probably will lead to an increase in the stock price. So you have that aspect of it that you have to look at. But also, you know, on Wigton as an, uh, in, in terms of the company itself is a very strong company. And more importantly, is an, a company that's in alternative energy that's poised to put on significantly more assets. So, you know, they have a significant amount of cash on their balance sheet because of their conservative dividend policy. And what that does is that if tomorrow morning the RFP comes out, there isn't a problem to finance some of the opportunities that exist, whether here in Jamaica or otherwise. So, you know, it's to put into perspective, right? I mean, once that, that control issue is sorted out, it can, be, it can sort out in a variety of different ways. Um, but ultimately, the company itself is I think is perfectly poised. It's 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 run. It's managed. It has all of this cash. Um, you know, it it's 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 going to do significantly better just as the business itself above and beyond the issue of control. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you anymore. That stock, by the way, folks, up by forty percent um, year to date, and uh, that gives it a market cap at a dollar ten. That's a market cap of about eleven billion, and they have four billion dollars cash. So you don't find many entities with forty percent of their market cap sitting in ready cash. That's what they call dry powder. <laughs> That's what they call dry so powder. Dan, yes, sir. So Dan, uh, we're now completing two months of the year. 
So that is an effective return of 240% annualized. Amazing. Right? So those of you that want to wait for the interest rate to come down, um, this is the kind of opportunity that you're missing out on. 100%. Couldn't agree with you more. So um, again, folks, with that, I just want to sort of recap very quickly. You know, there's a huge opportunity to get yourself some MJE stock because it's still trading even at $10.50 at over a 20% discount to the net asset value. And then that net asset value, which is tied into some great companies, and we talked about a few of them very briefly, SVL, CPJ, NCB, Wigton, Dollar, MEEG, you know, almost all of those companies are trading at very low prices, whether from a PE perspective or historical perspective. And as the, the entire environment is set such that we know inflation and interest rates are going to be trending down over the next 12 months. We can all argue about whether we think it's going to start to happen in three months, six months, nine months. Doesn't matter. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. The Bank of Jamaica cannot sustain having 30-day treasury rates at 10% per annum. It just doesn't make sense. How can you try to get your inflation back to 4 to 6% while keeping your interest rates at 10% on 30-day money? Unheard of. Won't work. Not sustainable. You're going to see that rate come back down to 4 or 5% within the next 12 months. And then those $100 billion worth of people who nice, fat, and lazy, earning 10% per annum, doing nothing, taking no risk, are going to have to work harder and invest their money harder. So they're going to have to do it the Mayberry way where you go and look for good opportunities and invest in it and get the capital appreciation. So that's the writing on the wall. I think it's well said. I'm really excited, looking forward to hearing the budget uh, debate because the government's going to be really focused on trying to stimulate the economy further, spending lots of money on infrastructure and all those nice things. And to me, it just sets the tone, as Philip Burgess says, there are lots of companies already doing well, but if you think they're doing well now, just imagine, you know, interest rates coming down, people having more disposable income, continuing to grow the GDP of the country, continuing to reduce debt. Hey, guys, it's inevitable. Now, now, now is the time to invest. And there are few opportunities greater than an MJE. So despite the results, you know, hearing that total assets were down by 2% and there was a $16 million comprehensive loss, which was all unrealized, by the way. The company still generates reasonable cash, has great asset values, is very under leveraged in terms of its debt book, and it's very well positioned for growth. So maybe it's only concern, in my view, is to keep raising money, to keep investing, because the market's going to turn and it's going to turn big. And I really look forward to coming back in the next six, nine, 12 months, right? To be able to say, I told you so. Remember when you could get NCB at $69 or you could get MG at $10.50 or you could get CBG at $9.50? In six months time, nine months time, we're going to all be saying, geez, I wish I had taken advantage of those opportunities. So, Mr. Perry, I want to just allow you one last Parting, parting word when we talk about MGE and the future growth prospects of the business and what you guys are going to be doing over the next 6 to 12 months? Well, um, I have a couple of things to say. Uh, the first one is, you know, the results are the results. Um, it's 14 million reduction, 14 million US reduction in the comprehensive income. But what's interesting is that the prior period, there was an increase of 30 odd million US yep. dollars. And, you know, that came from a period where people thought that, you know, the, the market wasn't going to do as well. And we were still able to earn $30 million. So even with this downturn and increase in interest rates, you have only seen the value of the portfolio move move down by 14. So you, you've preserved over 60% of the gain from the, the, the prior period. A lot of that has to do with <clears throat> how we manage the business. Um, you know, the position of, you know, holding certain dividend yielding stocks has generated a lot of cash that helps to keep your expenses, et cetera, down. So that's one. Um, two, I remember late last year, you know, when we started to take certain positions, people were complaining and saying, hey, listen, um, you know, the stock market is not going to do well. Um, you know, you shouldn't be investing in stocks right now. In, in fact, Dan, you know, we, we actually had an arranger say to us, you know, you know, they wouldn't be able to raise money, um, you know, because the expectation is that the market is not going to do well. 
And so when we started to take positions in a couple of stocks, I think the, mo the one I got the most recognition was NCB. Yeah. You know, at the time, you know, people were scared. People were running away from NCB. And we said, hey, now is the time to make the investment. You know, it's it's going to do, it's, we think it's going to do well. And, you know, it, it was instructive because you have a lot of managers that actually run away from the stock market when they should be coming to the stock mm -hmm. market. And we, we showed that last year. So when we saw what was happening with NCB, it was clear that there was a turnaround coming. It was clear to us that dividends were going to restart. And we looked on and said, you know, in good times, you know, this was a stock that was paying good dividends, had nice capital appreciation. And, you know, why we couldn't get it cheaper? And it's cheap now. Yep. You know, so why not, why not take it on? And so we took it on. And, you know, as in keeping with a portfolio like ours, and this is why you have to have the courage of your conviction, you know, the stock went lower before it went higher. And so you had to record that loss associated with that purchase. But that's why we manage the business the way we manage it, because we're diversified, we're large, we can sustain those kind of, um, those kind of negative downturns until we get the upside, right? Um, and the beautiful thing about NCB, you know, the stock continues to be undervalued because there's a bunch of people that's out there waiting on an APO that they think is going to be priced below the market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things we have said to people is what happens if you get an announcement that there's not going to be an APO, right? Um, because at the end of the day, our, our position is that the rate of profit growth of NCB um, whatever the rumors are of the sizes of an APO, within two to three quarters, you you're, you're, you can generate that internally. So why do an APO, right? And so, you know, do you want to be caught with trying to time the stock, expecting to have an APO, so you're not going to buy you now at 65 or 68? And I can tell you, tomorrow morning they announce that they're not doing an APO, that's an $80 stock, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, because all those people that are selling the stock hoping to get it cheaper in an APO, you know, be careful. Yeah. Right? Be very careful. Right? Um, if an APO comes, we're going to buy more. If an APO doesn't come, we've already bought and we're still going to buy more. Right? And so that's how we manage um, that risk. And the final point is, you know, if every time you work with Monday morning quarterbacking, and, you know, everybody at some point said that interest rates are going to go higher, they're going to go lower, you know, because even the same central bank indicated that, you know, we got this thing under control and people are making certain investments based on that. Um, subsequently, things have changed um, and it seems as though it might be elevated. And this is something that I think is important for our listeners out there um, to understand. We, we make our decision based on the best available data at a point in time. It's easy to come a year after to say, hey, did, did you guys realize interest rates are going to go up? Um, no, because at some point last year, BOJ said we're going to take this thing out of control and we have it under control. But then subsequently, it went out of control. Um, you've seen recently where the BOJ themselves, I mean, I've never seen it before, yep, would have come out and said that, hey, you know, their interpretation of the subsidy by the government, um, it's, it, it's, it didn't have as big an impact as they expected, right? Um, it's nothing to beat them up about. They're humans. They make estimates just like everybody else. And like everybody else, you can be you can be incorrect. And that's the same reason that we invest the way we invest, mm -hmm. based on the available data. We think that this 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 purchase makes sense. And because of the size of our portfolio, we can't buy ten shares. We right. have to buy millions or hundreds of millions of shares to 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 make a change. And I close by saying to not only my existing shareholders, but current shareholders out there, the metric you have to look on is the discount between the NAV, net asset value of this portfolio, and where the market is trading the stock. When you have a portfolio like this, if you're trading at such a high discount, you're expecting the NAV to go down. The reality is that the NAV is likely to go higher if interest rates remain the same level now or decrease, the NAV will go increase materially higher. Even if interest rates go up, our portfolio is positioned. We have certain stocks in the portfolio that with higher interest rates, 
um, the companies will do better because they have cash on their balance sheet so they'll earn from the higher interest rates, right? So again, it is a screaming buy because of the level of discount to NAV. And also if you look on how the portfolio is structured, right? But I keep saying, the longer you wait to buy, the more I can buy. Yeah. And that's not a problem. <laughs> so that's my comments on it. Um, you know, the stock is trading at a deep discount to its NAV. It shouldn't happen. Um, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you can look on the companies in the portfolio and you look for the next year to see how you expect them um, to perform and you make your decision. I agree. And Chairman Barry, I'll leave you with the parting words on the rest of the year and the prospects for MG. Well, I, I think, yes, I think the most exciting thing for me over the next 12 months is that we now have a clear runway to the general election. Mm. Mm. And uh, since the incumbent seems to be under a little pressure, mm -hmm. you know, they have to come with their A game. Yes. And I expect the spigots to open and the money to flow. So I think we're going to have a good year. And I hope you do too. Thank you for that, sir. I couldn't agree with you more. Again, I am excited to see the budget. I'm expecting a $30 billion increase in that budget. Government's going to be crazy about spending money, yeah, stimulating. 300 billion, billion Jamaican dollar. Yeah. Budget has moved from one trillion to one point three trillion. Oh, so, yeah, so that is a thirty percent increase I, I, in the budget. I, I, I beg your pardon. Sorry. And so when you think about the level of of, of expenditure and yes. where they mentioned, for example, like roads. Yes. So can you imagine what's going to happen to revenues for a company like Caribbean? Oh man, crazy. You know, so you just want the details from from the budget to see exactly where that money where is going to be spent. Um, but you know, I just I just don't see the year. I just don't see. I mean, whether you have What's clear to me with a budget that size, it, the probability of a general election before the end of the budget year, which is March 31st, is, is, is pretty high, right? So regardless of the outcome of the, the local government that's occurred, um, you know, given the size of that budget, um, that level of spending... Then why not have two back-to-back -back record budgets, exactly. Gary, nope, nope. and then call the election? No rush. That, no, no, that would be wonderful. No, that, no if that happens, I mean, <laughs> you definitely need to buy MJE now. <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, I would be surprised if you if you go to full term. I mean, it's September 2025, one way or the other. But if they do, I think the stock market is going to look very sexy going into next year i can't wait I, there you go i really can't wait stay tuned folks uh it's gonna happen it's gonna be a great year for the market that's my prediction we look forward to coming back the next six months uh with an with an update in that regard well that's it for today's discussions i'd like to thank our viewers as usual for tuning in big thanks to our panelists mr barry and mr period for joining us today and for providing those great insights if you're curious about our updates on our virtual investor forum, then find us on social media. We share live stream dates and upcoming guests on our social media pages. So give us a follow to learn all things forum related. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Mayberry Investments Limited, and click the bell to receive all notifications. Keep safe, folks, and remember, wise investors, slow and steady wins the race. Goodbye. The Mayberry Investments Limited Virtual Investor Forum has been the standard for investor education in Jamaica for decades, where top financial minds provide comprehensive insight into the market and ideal investment strategies and opportunities for our clients. Celebrating 37 years of excellence in investment banking. The Mayberry Virtual Investor Forum. Investing in Jamaica.